Um, now, I'd like to call on uh, Anna Avrakil uh, to speak next. Um, Anna is an international media consultant uh, who works within her own company, AAM. So, um, as Alicia said, I've been a journalist, actually it's coming up for 30 years, I hasten to add. I can do the maths, I started when I was about five. Um, <laughs> And I've worked for most of the big international broadcasters and news agencies. Um, and until a few years ago, uh, I worked for BBC. Since then, um, I've specialised in crisis media management and helping people to understand the role of media in helping to promote your organisation or business, be it a charity, an SME, big blue chip company or government organisation. And the need to promote is really, really important but also that the media aren't the great Satan. Okay, we're there to tell stories, we're there to try and help as well. So, in those 30 years, things have changed. Um, you know, in the old days, newspapers, radio, TV, very straightforward, time to consider things. Um, you know, three channels over here, then four. Um, some of you might have been around when there was only two. I vaguely remember the BBC Two test trained um, broadcasts. Um, and just in the last few years since I've left the BBC, things have changed. How many of you are on Facebook? Okay, not many. Twitter? LinkedIn? Okay, that's pretty low for, in the last few years, things have gone up at things like this. It looks really confusing, and this actually isn't up to date, so I couldn't find an up to date one. There are thousands of platforms, but it if you look at it more like this, they make sense, okay? So they all do different things. So for instance, for video, you've got Vimeo and YouTube. I expect you've heard of YouTube. Um, for social networking, you've got things like Facebook. Um, you've got LinkedIn is a really good business one. I get lots of work through LinkedIn. It's basically my online CV. If I'm talking to clients, I can see straight away who they are, who they've worked with, who they know that I know. It's a fantastic resource now. And the days where you could say, I don't need all that, have long gone. With that though, um, there is a problem, because in crisis management, it means that everything is out there. Now, the number of shipping companies present on social ne networks has increased, increased, whether it's been voluntary or involuntary. Um, last year, research was done into 144 companies, 76% of MVOCCs and 83% of shipping companies are present on the social media. Um, CNTEL, who did the survey, focused on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. However, it doesn't mean that these companies have actually put their ships on social networks. Um, a lot of them are unofficial and it comes through fans who put them up on Facebook or customers and clients who don't like them and they are up on Facebook. Um, Wikipedia, Facebook draws things from Wikipedia. If somebody has put an entry on Wikipedia, it's there. It may not always be correct. And this is another issue that people have uh, to do. Um, the unofficial pages that are on um, Facebook don't really produce any messages. But Hanjin, which has 1,951 likes on Facebook, never publishes anything. But it's all from unofficial pages on Wikipedia. And by neglecting these networks, um, you're, you're losing all those opportunities to address your customers, your stakeholders directly. Um, and you're also leaving the branding in the hands of other people. And for those of you, you know, we've talked about branding and for Cyprus as well. This is something that's really important. And it's really important to control the branding yourself. Um, okay, so breaking news. You can guarantee that the first place that anything happens is via mobile phones now and that ends up on Twitter. Now, I'll quickly run through what Twitter does, for those of you who don't know. It's just a mass of big, lots of conversations. Okay, so imagine in this room in the break time, you're wandering around, and you're hearing conversations you're quite interested in, you'll dip in, you'll dip out, you'll go into another conversation. And these days, everybody's got an opinion. Okay, you can only use 140 characters, and when, but, certainly in this kind of arena, these are some of the issues, this just means it's a topic of conversation. It's, it's nearly five o'clock. At three o'clock every afternoon, if you go onto Twitter and see what's trending worldwide, Justin Bieber, 
because all the little girls in America are getting up and they're tweeting about Justin Bieber. Every day it's the same thing. But when there's a disaster or an incident happening, very often these will be the hashtags. And that's what the conversation is. So you can link to those and it will give you everything that anyone is saying on those particular topics, which is so important, again, to create those hashtags and have conversations around them. Okay. When the Costa Concordia sank, okay, just in a three-day period, there were more than 35,000 tweets, nearly 11,000 blog mentions, more than 34,000 news mentions online, let alone all traditional media, although very often it was people sharing and retweeting and posting traditional stuff, and over well, 4,600 4, YouTube mentions. So it's been a nightmare from the first tweets of something happening, um, the recordings of the, ro the radio conversation between the Coast Guard and the captain. Now, I was at the, um, no, I had left the World Service by then, but we had the Italian recording. My cousin's Italian, and she was saying to me, oh my God, it's even worse than Italian when you hear what's going on. Nothing now stays private. The days where you could say, we keep a dignified silence, it'll go away. It won't. I mean, I run social media accounts for various organisations, and I've been told specifically by the board, don't respond to all the negative comments. And I've said, but they're all talking about us, we need to put the record straight. No, 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 we never talk to the media. Finally, when I'm allowed to say something, and I kind of point them to things on the website or correct information, I get comments like, ha, huh, now you understand what social media is about. I'm doing it under their name, not mine, which I suppose is my reputation. But you, you can't ignore it. Um, obviously, with Costa Concordia, it's still continuing. Um, the, uh, the resort or the, the port, Giglio, at least 80 million euros now they're claiming as compensation. Because what I'm talking about at the end of the day is about business and it's about money and it's about reputation. And that's why it's so important to factor the media into everything you do. Um, and then we've just had Genoa the other week, was it last week, even, you know, this is just from yesterday, this is what was being said, um, and you can see things like, you know, crisis management, um, I didn't actually do a world news, I didn't actually do a hashtag <coughs> conversation, I just looked up Gen Genoa. Okay. And then obviously Cyprus has its own news. Okay, this is just again, just from the last few days. So when, so where social media has its benefits and where the planning comes in, um, you can see the hashtag survived. Uh, sorry. Last August, the Japanese government started a series of meetings looking at how social media can be used in a crisis. And it's things like allowing emergency 911 calls to be placed through social networks, such as Twitter during natural disasters. Because one of the biggest problems when something happens to your organisation is your switchboard is going to get jammed with people ringing up wanting to know what's going on, when, whereas actually you need those lines free. Um, so representatives from different government agencies and emergency services met with officials and various social networks looking at how to use this social networking where the traditional voice-based infrastructures um, were going down in the disaster. <clears throat> so Twitter's head of... Um, uh, the head of Twitter in Japan, rather, blogged in a series of entries on how to use Twitter as a lifeline during crisis situations, including posting and searching for emergency and transport information, as well as calling for help, and how users could provide updates about their condition. They suggested adding hashtag survived to tweets to help family and friends who might be worried. There are also crowdsourcing platforms, and basically what that means is, it's up there in the, in the clouds, um, Ushahidi.com is probably one of the most well known now and it's transformed disaster response. Um, it basically it maps information um, sent in by the public. Um, it can send it in via SMS, Twitter, email, the web. So there's various ways, even if the internet goes down, hopefully your phone networks are up. Um, it's also being used to organise and prioritise resources to help victims and also provide information to those that can help them. And it can be set up in a matter of hours. Um, it's been used in crisis, humanitarian and uh, disaster situations, including um, the Japan earthquake. 
um, extreme weather conditions. If you look up snowmageddon.com, that was the New York snow. Interestingly also, um, human rights abuses in the MENA. And obviously for maritime, it's um, the Gulf oil, it was tracking Gulf oil um, incidents. Another platform which, uh, this is Glenn's uh, platform, um, and I work quite closely with him on some issues. This is basically um, live um, contributions from members in the industry about what's going on in their sections. You, you've got um, collaborations. This is when there's something, an emergency going on. I'm, I'm, this is just my uh, status. There's a regular news feed, but that's also going out on Twitter all the time. And it's all contributions from ship, ships, captain staff, industry. And maybe something that Cyprus can look at. Um, and as you can see, this was at the time of the Horn of Africa, obviously a lot of piracy going on. But everything um, is shipping related, and it's a fantastic resource for sharing information. And as we know, smartphones are, <laughs> um, the, the figures are something like 87% of the world's population now um, have got a smartphone, which is why so that, you can see the picture of the riots there. Um, so Cyprus isn't immune, as we know, to crises, and um, even yesterday, the EU Commission President Barroso opened a new emergency response centre um, to, among other things, support the Commission's humanitarian intervention, interventions and provide specialist services across the Commission during emergency situations. And he specifically he mentioned this as one of the things that have led to the um, establishment. I really hope and trust that, apart from all the infrastructure and the emergency ops and things, that media is taken seriously and is at gold command exec level with all the planning. Um, okay, so when things happen, the media find out. And as part of your risk assessments and strategy, you've got things in place and protocols, the media have the same thing. As soon as you now probably on Twitter or it drops on the wire, the, in the newsrooms, it's all everyone knows what to do. You're going to get crews out there, you're going to get correspondents on air. Um, you might break the news on a big one, um, break into programming. You, it's really important that everybody plays their part in this. And you've got to think about what your customers, what your um, what relatives, what victims are going to need to know if something happens to them, or how it's going to look in the eyes of the public. Okay, so this is a classic mistake. As I said, you hope it's going to go away. It won't. Okay, 24-hour news is very, very hungry. And actually, having come out of that environment and, and helping customers, I can see now why people get upset with the journalists. But you know, you've got a news editor screaming at you that they need information. You're going to go to anybody that will talk to you. And unfortunately, it's not always correct. So you need to make sure that you're the person that they come to. Otherwise, the crisis will be far worse. And people tend to remember what they hear first and what they hear last not somewhere in between. So, it's really important to be prepared like anything, and you start putting your crisis um, strategy together. So the first thing to think about is who's your target audience? The public, media, decision makers, your teams and staff, troublemakers, customers. Think about who, how all those, um, who all those people are, and then how are you going to reach them? Um, and part of that is actually cultivating your media connections in advance. Get to know who the relevant correspondents are in those areas. Um, I work a couple of days a week with the Press Association's consultancy arm, and um, Celebrity Cruises had asked them to do the PR. Oh, um, celebrity Cruises had asked them to do the PR for their big launch of one of their ships. Unfortunately, the volcano blew up in Iceland and everyone was stranded, and there's no way the media were going to focus on this fabulous launch of this new ship. Um, so all this money that had been spent, and everyone was thinking, what do we do now? They decided to send the ship down to Bilbao. They picked up 2,000 British um, holiday makers who were stranded. The, a team from my company were on the, um, the ship. We were sending out B-roll, which is basically the stuff that news organisations use underneath somebody talking of what was going on. There was also interviews with the captain, various key people on board ship. It went everywhere. It was fantastic publicity, probably better than the launch would have been, but it was just a way of being prepared. What are the worst things that can happen? It could be over in this country, it's often bad weather. Um, but, you know. The other mistake, and I kind of know that this is the extreme, 
when people talk about social media, they think it's a young person's thing. If you've done the maths earlier, I'm not that young. I've had to learn how to do all this stuff, and it's how I'm making my living. And I, have, I do have a love-hate relationship with it, because I, am, I like bits of paper. I'm not helping the rainforest situation at all. But um, the mistake is you get a young person straight out of college to do the social media side, or comms, or marketing, because it's a young person's thing. What they won't have is the maturity and experience to deal with things when things go particularly wrong or deal with the awkward people. So, you know, if you take one thing away from me today, it is invest in good media and marketing um, staff and infrastructure. Okay, is ignorance bliss? Um, I mean, Neil will probably talk about this in a minute, but in terms of things like security threats, poisoning, um, health issues, they're always very difficult areas to talk about because by their very nature, you can't obviously discuss them. Um, but if you don't talk about it, people are going to worry about it. If you do, people will be worrying about it. So what's the lesser of the two evils? Um, and that's something that in your board level meetings is something that you can discuss and the media person will be able to say, this is what it's probably going to look like, this is what the journalists are going to ask. I was really fortunate that I spoke to Jackie Brock Doyle, um, who was director of comms for the London Olympics, um, because I'd actually been commissioned to write something on crisis media management and how, how basically the Olympics had messed it up. Of course, the Olympics came and went, and we all had an amazing Olympics. And from the crisis comms point of view, it was textbook case. And she said to me the reason was that from the moment they were putting in the bid, marketing and media were at board level. So seven years after getting the bid, she also had knew all the heads of the emergency services, the mayor's office, um, the, uh, uh, the Olympics, everybody involved. And they would come together, all the directors of communication, once a month leading up. So by the time they got to the Olympics, they were all friends. So when things happened, they were able to deal with it really quickly, respond in the right way. In fact, again, this company that I'm working with provided a lot of the media training for one of the key players, um, the transport players. And, you know, we had a fantastic Olympics. For Cyprus, these are some of the things that, just off the top of my head, could be potential stories. Um, you've got, uh, obviously, we've talked about the gas. Trafficking is a big problem in Cyprus, and coming through from Odessa now um, by ships is one of the, Cyprus is one of the destinations. Piracy, probably not so much of a problem at the moment, but you don't know, it's kind of increasing. Um, obviously, it has a knock-on effect on tourists. The Euro we've talked about, we've got terrorism, you've got geopolitical situations, and then we've also got the new marina. All these things are potential stories, um, good and bad, and you've got to sit down and work out what those are. So, thinking ahead, establish the internal, internal procedures for emergency alerts. Have almost an initial press release template ready. Um, what can you say in each of these situations? You know, in, in, um, I, I do a lot of advice with Kidnap and Ransom. Very often we don't want to say anything because the terrorists love publicity. So it's how much can we give without endangering lives or, or giving the terrorists more publicity. All those things have got to be weighed up. What can't be said? You know what, if you go out there, you're going to get poisoned to the point that you're not going to live anyway. Do you want to give that kind of information out? However, you can tell people what they can do to protect themselves. Um, how are you going to say it in the event of a disaster? And we, we'll come to BP, but you know, they, they screwed that up. Richard Branson is the master of disaster crisis comms. And how are you going to ensure that your staff are fully briefed? Because, you know, you could get me as your spokesman and I'm up there making these bold statements. Somebody rings through or speaks to someone on reception. They go, oh, we're all scared. We don't know what to do. You know, these things have got to go from top to bottom. Just think about what you would want to do. Never, ever lie. Have some responses prepared that you can adapt. You've got to be accountable. Um, and ensure that you have the right spokespeople. I train people, and sometimes the CEOs aren't going to be your best person to get in front of the camera. You know, and it takes someone outside to be able to say to them, you know what, maybe not for you. Think of somebody else that can do it. Because that is your, that's going to be the face of your company. It's got to be someone who is cuddly, you know, audience friendly, because that's what everyone expects. And deal with the calls and inquiries. Your crisis communication teams, I suggest that's the minimum. There may be some doubling up there. 
Um, for a bigger companies, so you may want to think about outsourcing that. There are companies that provide that kind of service. And a social media release. So rather than thinking, oh, what am I going to write in the press release? Okay, the ship has sunk, uh, 50 people on board, uh, rescue services are there, and then you've got all your background information because it's already on your website about how the company works, who to speak to. You could do a video of the chairman speaking if he's, socially, uh, if he's media aware. Okay, these are the various positions. Again, you've got legal ramifications. Um, there are, you, you might not want to say anything because relatives haven't been yet informed of something happening. All those things. So you've got to be quite careful about what could be the reasons why and what do we say on all of those things. The really important thing is to be reassuring. You've got to react immediately. Even if you've got nothing to say, I was speaking to the former commander of, um, of uh, counter-terrorism for the Met Police last two weeks ago. And he was saying, I don't talk to the press, but that was then. You can't do that now. Even if it's to say, I don't know anything, as soon as we've got something, we'll come back to you. But we are aware that there is a problem and we're, we're, we're dealing with it. What are you trying to say? You've got to be positive. Not in a, hey, a hundred people have died, but you know, very, very reassuring and positive that something's been doing, you know, something's been done. You must provide regular updates, which again is why your social media is so useful to do it for you. Um, and do agree to interviews with key outlets. I would suggest the agencies, the BBC, CNN, they go all over the world and everybody picks that, that up. So they're, they're your best bets. And then monitor what people are saying about you. It's so important. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly rush through. It's not enough just to have a press conference these days. You've got to think about all those things. If you can live stream it, saves an awful lot of journalists arriving on your doorstep. Make sure you've got Wi-Fi so somehow people can feed their uh, copy back. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, when you break a China plate, you can't put it back together again, and reputation is like that. So you've got to be really careful. I'm just going to whiz really through these now. But do engage with the conversation. It's reputation is <coughs> so hard to build. Um, and create a page to prove responses to your teams so they know what to do when something happens. Okay, BP, the classic. I mean, it's still, today I saw that they're asking the British government now to help bail them out. Um, what started off as bad publicity, then when it became a, a PR offensive. Um, go online, look up Google, look, Google um, look up BP funnies, you'll see all sorts of um, stuff coming up. This guy, I mean, you know, he wasn't seen for a week. The chairman, Steve Hayward, wasn't seen for a week. And when he did, he said, I want this sorted as quickly as everybody else. I want my life back. Didn't go down too well with all the businesses and people who relied on the marine um, in infrastructure for their livelihoods. Um, again, I said, actually, if you look up um, BP coffee spoof, you'll, you'll see a lot of that. It's quite funny. Um, okay. So just a quick acronym, truth, tell the truth, do research what could go wrong, understand the media interest, use them to get the messages out, take control and stay human. That is the biggest problem for big organisations in particular, that you know you lack that, one lacks that kind of, you become, you become an institution. Um, but I wanted to end on a happy ending, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the Zenvia, because I've dived on these many times, and I'm really excited to hear about the uh, reefs that are going to be established. Sorry? No, 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 this is the Zenvia. But I just wanted a happy ending. There are so many good things happening in Cyprus, but, you know, with all these new initiatives, get the media involved from the beginning, at board level, gold command level for emergency services. So that's me. Um, this is what I do.